Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to look at system resources. We got a mouthful of abbreviations IO, IRQ, and DMA. We're going to step through what each of those is. And although they look a little unusual, these are really important to know about. So we're going to decipher and make sure that you're aware of how those are used inside of your computer, because those system resources are incredibly important. In fact, in test 220-601, section 11, we need to identify the fundamental principles of using personal computers. And there's really nothing more fundamental than the IO, the IRQ, and the DMA settings inside of your computer. There's 220-602 in section 12. We also need to identify tools, diagnostics, procedures, Procedures. If you're ever running into problems with IRQs, with memory addressing, those are really difficult problems to work through. But there's things that you can do in your operating systems and troubleshooting techniques that you can use to start determining where those problems are happening. So today we're going to get an overview of what these system resources are. What is an IO address? What is an interrupt re request? And how can we use direct memory access, or DMA? We're going to talk about memory addressing and talk about how we might identify conflicts and change system resources, if, if necessary, inside of our personal computer. Let's step through some of these system resources. Let's start with something called an IO address, an input output address. Every Every single component that's in your computer has an I.O. address. And that's the way that the CPU is able to access that particular device is through an address. It's the way, for instance, in your home, you have an address. The way that people are able to communicate with you is they can send some mail to your address, and you're able to read what's going on. Your computer works exactly the same way. Your CPU sends you some mail, sends some mail down to your keyboard, and your keyboard has a specific address that it's listening on. And if anything comes across that bus with its address, it knows that that particular piece of mail is for the keyboard, and they can start reacting and doing different things. Now, one of the things that you get into when you start looking at these addresses is these are some crazy addresses. This is not 123 Main Street. This is these hexadecimal type numbers that you would run into in the device manager. Um, this is why you have such a big address space inside of your computer, is because there are all kinds of different components in your computer. You've got memory. There's different adapter card slots. There's different onboard controllers. You have a, a separate South Bridge that has all kinds of connections to it, from your Ethernet to your hard drives to floppy drives to serial ports. And finally, who knows what you want to put in those adapter cards that are in your computer, extremely customizable. So your PC architecture has to be designed in a way that it can add more addressing. If you want to build a new house, you have to be able to assign a, an address to that new house. And that's exactly the way that this addressing was set up, so that you're able to do that. And because it's a big 32-bit address, you've got plenty of room here. Here. Now, this, this really designed this addressing scheme to be able to handle us well into the future. If you ever want to look and see how your I.O. addressing is inside of your computer, you can do that from your desktop. And what you want to do is go into your control panel. And inside your control panel, let's go into your system configuration under your hardware tab and start the device manager. If you happen to have your My Computer setting, on your desktop. You can right mouse click and choose properties for that, and it'll bring up your device manager as well. Now, your device manager has a lot of different things going on, but notice this is all sorted by the devices themselves. There's a view pull down menu, though, that talks about resources. I can look at resources by type or by connection. Resources by connection gives me this view that shows me DMA, IO, IRQ, and memory, which happens to be exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So that view, resources by connection, becomes very useful when we're talking about these kinds of issues. Let's look at the input-output settings. So I've got two different buses on this system. And boy, I've got a lot of different addressing on here. And if you scroll down through here, Notice all the different components that you happen to have in your system. You get down near the bottom, and you're getting past the onboard components. Now we start looking at the other things that you added, like a Sound Blaster card or a printer port, things you might recognize that aren't necessarily on the motherboard itself. That's the addressing scheme. And notice the addressing scheme might have a single number. For instance, the secondary IDE channel for your hard drive is addressed 00000376. 
to 376. That's just one single address. There are other devices that have more than that because there's more things that go on. They're more complex devices, like a communications port. It has more than one address. But whenever we refer to those ports, we usually refer to it with the very, very first or the beginning I.O. address associated with that piece of hardware. All of these addresses are in hexadecimal format. And don't let that throw you. The reason that we put it in hexadecimal format is because it's hard for us human beings to understand everything in ones and zeros. In fact, if you wanted to look at one of these addresses as binary, as a one and a zero, this is what it would look like. Zero, 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 zero. All these zeros, and then there's zero, zero, one, one, and one, 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 and zero, one, one, one. That's too much for my mind to keep up with. I can't recognize what that happens to be. So us as human beings, we split this up into smaller pieces, and we refer to it in a format called hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is a way to count in uh, from 0 to 15. It's in 16. So it fits well in that 8-bit type environment, 16-bit, 32-bit. Now you're starting to see this, this increment of 8 show up, and hexadecimal is exactly the same way. Notice that four zeros together is hexadecimal zero. Notice that a zero, zero, one, one in binary happens to be a three in hexadecimal. Notice this goes from zero to seven, eight, nine, but there's no 10 in hex. There's an A, a B, a C, a D, an E, and an F. That gets us all 16 different of these hexadecimal values. So what we do is we'll take that long binary string and we'll split it up into chunks of four. And then for each chunk, we'll refer back to our hexadecimal chart. So 0, 0, 0, 0, well, that's easy. That's 0 in hex. A 0, 0, 1, 1 is 3 in hexadecimal. And then we just fill in the rest. So by the time we're done looking at that binary string, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, F7. And if we refer back to our I.O. addressing, we can even find a 0, 3, F7. That's our standard floppy disk controller. So when our CPU sends the string of the ones and zeros down the bus, it's interpreted by our floppy disk controller as being addressed to it. By us human beings wanting to refer to it, we're always going to refer to it in this hexadecimal format because it's just easier for us to look at in a big list of things. And whenever you look at documentation and you look at the Windows configuration, it's always going to be in hexadecimal. Well, now that we know how our CPU talks to the different devices in our system by their input-output address, how do we tell the separate systems to talk to the CPU? The CPU generally is just sending information out. We have to have some way to get the attention of the CPU, to interrupt it. And we call those things an interrupt request or an IRQ. So this is a way, for instance, when you hit a key on your keyboard, it informs the CPU, hi, I'd like to talk now. Could you please let me communicate with you for a moment? The CPU stops what it's doing, says, oh, I have someone who would like to speak with me. And then it goes through and processes that information this keyboard is sending, and then it continues on its way. Only when you hit a key does it actually interrupt the CPU, which makes things very efficient inside of your computer. The way that this is really handled is your keyboard is talking to something called a programmable interrupt controller, or a PIC, a PIC. There are, in, a, in the old school PICs, this is an older type technology, there were 16 IRQs available to use. And you can see those listed out in the device manager. In fact, let's flip back to our virtual machine and look in our device manager. I'll show you what that looks like. We'll go up and look at interrupt requests. So there they are. There's all the interrupt requests on here. If we happen to add a 17th device, though, we might run into problems because every device needs to have its own interrupt. Generally, devices cannot share the same interrupt. So what happened was that as, as our computers got more complex and we started adding more components, there was an upgrade to the PIC called an advanced PIC. And this is usually found in the Southbridge. It's not a separate a controller. It's usually something that's integrated into that Southbridge chip, and that expands the number of IRQs up to 24. So now we've got a lot more to work with in some of our more modern systems. So every piece of hardware we add has an interrupt associated with it, generally speaking, as if it needs to interrupt that CPU. And that's the way that we are able to see what's going on is through this interrupt request. Our CPU is awfully busy putting things into memory, taking things out of memory, 
having processes occur there. But there are some situations where the devices on your system themselves might want to bypass the CPU. What if they could just go directly to memory and grab the information they need? Well, they can do that through a process called Direct Memory Access, or DMA. You usually see DMA only used on devices that need to have an unfettered access to memory and don't want to get bogged down in how the CPU is running. So things like sound cards, you see this in games. You don't want the sound to stutter because the CPU is so busy. So sound cards have specialized hardware on them that allow them to bypass the CPU and go directly to the memory where that particular sound information is stored. That makes it very fast and very efficient, and we don't have to worry so much about what the CPU happens to be doing at that time. Now, not all devices are going to be able to support direct memory access. There's extra hardware that has to be on that piece of, of equipment that happened to be using. It has to has it have its own processor. It has to be a little bit smarter. It has to have a good reason. It's much easier to have the CPU do all the work for us. And so you'll notice that your direct memory access list in your computer in your device manager may only have four or five or six different devices in it, which is really a very small subset of what you might happen to have inside of your system. What happens is there is a centralized DMA controller. And that's how things work these days, is that there's a single controller that goes in and out of memory. And everything that can support DMA will talk to that controller. So that controller becomes the middle piece that keeps everything straight. Otherwise, there'd be devices going into memory and just accessing it willy-nilly. We can't have devices overriding each other. And so that controller is really useful for the latest round of hard drives. Hard drives do something called this bus mastering, which is really just a way of doing DMA access into memory so that the hard drives don't have to go to the CPU to process what they're doing, they can go directly to memory to pull things in and out and write them to hard drives. And so the hard drives have really increased in the amount of throughput we're able to get to them because they don't require you going to your CPU. They just write to memory directly. One thing you may find in legacy hardware is where a piece of hardware is using part of the memory inside of your system for its own purposes. And it's actually reserving a section of that for its own purposes. You may see, for instance, that a card that's set up with a boot ROM, maybe it's a hard drive controller or a network card, may be using up a section of memory addresses. And those memory addresses that would normally be available for you to put your own things in, it's taken those for itself. And that's because it's the only way that these particular devices are able to grab certain sections so that the CPU can access them, where instead of the CPU going to the real memory, the CPU is going into the memory that's on that particular piece of hardware. You see this also if uh, the video cards, legacy video, used a section of memory addresses. Now, these are different than the I.O. addresses. I.O. addresses that we looked at earlier with all that hexadecimal was referring to how we access the address of your house, for instance. But it didn't change what was inside of your house. It didn't rearrange anything inside your living room. Whereas memory addresses are doing exactly that. That's the actual memory inside of it. So there will be an I.O. address that gets it to the video card, and then a separate memory address that accesses the things that are inside of that video card, or that network card, or that hard drive controller. And so we use that addressing scheme to be able, especially with memory, to go in and directly change what's on a particular piece of hardware. And it's just a very easy way to have these hard drive controllers and network cards start things up automatically without us even having to do anything on our side. Obviously, this all sounds good until you have a conflict. You obviously can't have two houses with the same address. The mailman wouldn't know exactly where to leave that particular package. You also can't have a problem where two devices have the same interrupt number. Otherwise, whenever somebody interrupted, the CPU wouldn't know exactly which one was talking to it at that particular time. The way that you see if anything has a conflict is back in our device manager. So let's flip back over to our virtual machine and look in our device manager. Here we can start to see, for instance, all the different IRQs. If any device had a conflict, one of the things that you would see is from your default view, devices by type, all of this right now is collapsed. Everything has a plus sign next to it. But if anything had a conflict with memory addresses, I.O. addresses, or the IRQs, you would see a little tag next to each one of these. There would be a little yellow tag that says, there's a conflict here. 
with every single device in your computer. Maybe we just added this Ethernet adapter, and it got a flag. It said, there's a conflict. Normally, Windows figures those things out on its own. But if the piece of hardware, for some reason, isn't working properly, or it isn't set up to be able to handle the conflict, or it doesn't support an IRQ that's available, then you'll be able to move into this and look into the Resources tab inside of that device. And in here, you'll start to see some things that look very similar. So here's here you're familiar. You've got an I.O. range. There's the input-output addressing range that we looked at. Here's the memory range. There's actually memory on this adapter card that we can reference. And there's an IRQ of 11. So there's an example of where we're looking at I.O. addressing, we're looking at memory addressing, and we're looking at the IRQ. That means that nothing else in the system can share these. If there is something that uh, Windows identifies that there's another device in here that's sharing this, you may have the option to change the setting. It's grayed out on my screen, but yours may be able to click that button, and depending on what hardware is available for that particular device, you're able to change it maybe to an IRQ that's available. Again, Windows tends to take care of those problems, and generally you'll see there's no conflicts. But if there is a conflict, it will tell you exactly what devices are fighting with each other, and you may be able to manually change some settings so that those devices can co cooperate with each other. There will be situations that you run into that certain pieces of hardware cannot interoperate with other pieces of hardware. That's extremely rare, but I have run into it, and it's because those devices all use use the same IRQ, and they can't change the IRQ no matter what you do. So you have to make a decision on which one you happen to use in that particular computer. The process for changing those system resources was exactly the same as we were seeing in our, our device manager. Under the Resources tab is where you'd make any change you wanted. In review, we've looked at system resources. You now understand exactly how the CPU addresses all of these different components in your system through I.O. addressing, how your interrupt requests get the ear of the CPU so that it can process what's going on in the outside world here, and how DMA and these memory addresses are used to send information into the memory that's inside of your computer. We've also seen in your device manager how you can go in and identify conflicts and change any of those system resources. For more a videos, to participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website at FreeAplus.com.